It's a specific kind of death. Well, he says, it's a specific. You want it on your feet or on your knees begging? In other words, do you want to be on the offensive? But the, it, that's not the issue. The issue is we use ourselves as bait. That's the thing that's missing. Okay. Fincher was great. The way he talked and the way he talked to actors, I was very moved by it because this young guy is sensitive enough to, to sort of uh, negotiate ideas with you and, and try to bring things out of you. But the way he did it was very, uh, I thought, very sensitive and very smart. The reason from a purely narrative point of view for this scene to exist is to see these guys' faces when, when we say to them, okay, you're no longer the, on, you're on the offensive, but you're no longer attacking this thing with any kind of rational, from any rational But I think point then you Will says, how are we gonna do that? And, and Kevin says, they want to use I know what they bait. want. They want to use this as a yeah. I remember the first day, and I'd been slightly nervous. Um, you know, he kept all the time making it real. It sounds a little too rehearsed. You know your lines too well. And he kept changing the lines on purpose so that you would f be more real. David knows exactly what he's doing. I mean, David Fincher is a genius, basically, for whom I would jump off London Bridge. I trust him implicitly. David is, uh, I mean, as you know, he's a young man. He's 28 years old, and uh, he's been given $50 million to play with. And he really knows what he wants. I'm smart enough to wait for some firepower to show up before we go out and fight the thing. Right, OK, sit it on your ass. Fine. Yeah, how about if I just sit here on my own? No problem. No problem. I forgot. You're the guy who made a deal with God to live forever. And all the rest of you pussies can sit it out, too. Me and her, we'll do all the fighting. Well, I think Dave, David has um, um, some good ideas, and he's, he's certainly receptive to ideas. I think he's a very, very talented man. It's like deja vu for me, really, because it's like when I did the first one with Ridley, it was the... Ridley was the same, you know, they have this, this magic eye, which gives you fantastic pictures to work with. Well, it's hard to have conversations with Fincher, really. I mean, I haven't, I don't know what he's like now, because he's got a few films under his belt, but it was, it was his first picture. And uh, he's not the most communicative of, of people. He's rather like Ridley, you know, he's a bit uh, monosyllabic. Uh, <laughs> not in his thoughts, but in his, in, his, in his words, you know. We're waiting on one cable. The cable, yeah, he's, uh, he's got most of them. He needs some more. Why don't we just poke a hole in the fucking wall right here? He's up there now. Oh, great. I'm being held captive by him. Uh, David was very uh, awkward with the crew. In fact, I, I found the whole thing so unpleasant that I left on the first day of shooting. I prepared all the clothes, made all the clothes, and then told David to get on with it because I actually found him very unpleasant to work with. Okay, ready? I'm going to the rehearsal line, please. Let's stand get by. This guy out of here. You can be a line producer with Fincher. You know, you can, you, you can, but it's hard to be a cre creative producer with Fincher. You know, that role sort of becomes very, you know, difficult. Because he doesn't, he's not interested, you know, once he's, once he's shooting. We had a big fight with Fincher during the course of the shooting, the we being Walter and me. Um, you know, once, we didn't really want to write the script because you, I've discovered once you, once you write it, uh, you, it, it kind of erodes your authority as producer, it just does. And in this case, uh, since Fincher had never directed a movie before, we wanted to kind of keep a, you know, firmer hand with him. We were watching dailies, and we had a big argument about character that Ralph Brown plays. I'd done a couple of scenes when I got these very heavy script changes through, which made Aaron into uh, rather more of a stupid character than he had been earlier. I'd seen it at the read-through. I thought that this character is actually supposed to be funny. And I thought, everybody else is funny in this movie. Ralph, what's happened to Ralph Brown? Why isn't he funny? And Fincher had some theory about how he wanted to play him as being sort of the middle-class hero and, you know, this and that and the other thing. And I thought, well, not this guy. This guy is the dumbest guy in the movie. This is, you know. So this is when we wrote in just to make sure that everybody knew where they stood about this character. You know, that they referred to him as 85. His nickname is now 85 which stands for an 85 IQ. So then I had to, I had to think again about how I was playing it. By this time, Aaron's got all their files, and he's going out. Ah, 85. 
77. So then it had to do with Ralph Brown's death. And, you know, he was supposed to get killed at a certain, or, you know, rather earlier moment in the movie than he does. And so when F Fincher and I, we, we talked to the phone, and he wanted to do it a completely different way. We went to Fox. We said, look, if you do that, this will alter the whole plot. They agreed with us. And we said, OK, now look. When I leave this meeting, I'm going to go call Fincher, I said, and I'm going to go tell him this is the way it's going to be. Now then, he's going to call you, and what are you going to say? And they said, we're going to tell him, absolutely. Fine, OK. So um, then they called us back for a meeting the next day, and they decided that his emotional commitment to this part of it was so strong that they were, in fact, going to go with him. He said, well, look, then I am not going to go back to London, um, you know, because then if I can't have the say over the script, you know, for the director in the first time movie, then you guys call me in post-production when you're going to need me. He hasn't acted like a first-time director, and I think that's one of the things that surprised Fox, because he isn't grateful for this amazing opportunity. He's not thank going, oh, yes, thank you so much, and I'll do whatever you say. He's sort of going, you gave me this job, and I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to do it the best I can, and if, you know, you know you're going to have to work with me. And I think... That attitude also has been very inspiring because these movies are very expensive and to a certain extent I think the studio does want you to make the best film you can. But they also feel that these are science fiction films and those of us who make these films are always trying to make a different kind of film than that. Actually Fox got a bit, uh, a bit upset with, with David because it did take so long. Action! One, two, Cut it! Cut it! Too late on the mirror. Far too late on the mirror. And, and it was jerky. Let me see that one back. Play it back for me really quickly. We were doing a lot of takes. We were, you know, we'd do like 12 or 15 takes quite often. And uh, then David would be uh, satisfied with that. And then Sigourney would say, I don't know about that last one, whether I couldn't do better, you know, and, and they would say, OK, we'll try it. So then we'd do another 15, you know. This is why I'm so full of admiration for David, that um, even as a debut director, he still had this vision and he was going to try and get it if he could, you know. Even so, the big guns, at, you know, at uh, Fox were saying, come on, hurry up, it's only an alien film, it's not, you know, not Gone with the Wind, it's not Lawrence or Arabia for Christ's sake. I, I suspect there were apprehensions about David Finch's ability to make it work because he'd come from the commercial world and I think that was an unfair pressure on him actually because he is very clever and his commercials are visually wonderful. So I, I do think he suffered from that. I think the studio probably were down on his neck a bit and I think that that's one of the reasons he was probably aggressive with a lot of the people around him because he was feeling a lot of pressure from the studio and the producers. I don't know what the collective noun for it producers is, but, you know, phalanx, uh, um, a wedge of producers, but there seemed to be these characters moving around, particularly with when Fincher was there, moving around, <clears throat> moving around the floor in unison, watching him or watching us. Well, I think the big problem um, is that he had to be essentially his own producer. And so after this endless day of doing a very demanding uh, filming, he would have to get on the phone like at midnight and talk to um, the brass at Fox and and they'd be saying don't shoot the next day I, we want to cut that it was I felt it was quite arbitrary and again it all arose from him not being uh, with the script. I think the biggest problem David had was that we never had a concrete draft of a script to go by and here he is directing his first movie following in the likes of Ridley Scott and James Cameron and you know it is very difficult to balance all of those things and I, I think that when you go through any production it's difficult it's hard I think when you go through your first one without a script it's even harder it's amazing to me that Fox is the number one studio in the country because they're all such a bunch of morons I'm not as clear-cut about who was fucked and who wasn't and because David was so initially um, in such an untenable creative position, but his sort of rage against the sort of, you know, Fox machinery, you know, 
sort of seemed to me to be like in place when I got there. So it was like, I didn't have a chance on that front. You know, I just sort of just watched that. When I left, they, they, you know, Landau was over, he was their man on the spot. I was um, the executive vice president in charge of feature production at 20th Century Fox. Um, in my responsibilities there, I oversaw the physical production of the movies we produced. He doesn't do that job anymore. And, you know, everyone who takes on that job, you know, which is sort of going from being, uh, you know, sort of usually a top of the line, line producer, to being the head of physical production at a studio, tries to invent a way to do it. My sense of what John got that job was that he really got very ambitious in his vision of his ability to do it. They, and they were both young. I mean, Lant, that wasn't much older. That, that's probably an interesting part about it. He was tough. He was very tough. And his, um, he was gonna, you know, take this bullshit from Fincher, and that was that, you know? You know, there was a point where, where I guess they really felt they were in trouble with, with Fincher. You know, Fox, you know, that they were, they didn't know if they were gonna get a movie. They were spending millions of dollars. He wasn't respectful of their uh, agenda. He was openly contemptuous at times, you know, and, and of very, very major executives in this business, you know. And um, I guess John was just given the mission to break him, you know, to break that. You know, we can't tolerate that. It's our money, you know, and you're going in there, kid. I think one of the things that happens in every production there are heated moments. And I think that unlike um, music videos, unlike commercials, feature films are shot over a much longer period of time. And whereas you might never reach a point on, on some of those shorter shoots, on a 100-day, 80-day schedule, you go through a lot together. And just like in any relationship, there are, there are conflicts, especially in the creative process where people don't necessarily see eye to eye. It doesn't mean that any one person's opinion is wrong. And you could have very heated conversations. And you know, I think as a, a studio executive or as a producer, it's your responsibility to bring up those things that are sometimes hard to hear. It was about money, pure and simple. You know, he'd want to do something that's too expensive, you can't do that. You know, that's all it was. You know, Finch attended to keep most of his, uh, you know, the tribulations from upstairs, all the trouble that was going on behind the scenes, such as it was. He kept it from us. He did confide more, I know, I've learned later, in, um, in Brian Glover. Uh, he was closer to Brian. And Brian was, you know, Brian was lovely and experienced. And I think he kept Finch's, you know, morale up as well, you know? Because you forget how young he was, David, you know? Um, and for all the, you know, for all the bravura and bravado and youth and the energy in the world, you know, when you're getting day in, day out, I think the kind of grief that he was getting, or just the pressure, um, you know, I think he did fantastically well just to keep a smile on his face. David was put in a really difficult situation. Um, when you're a first time director, you don't have a lot of the controls that you have after you establish yourself. And I, I think that from a directorial standpoint, the situation David was put in could not have been more frustrating for a director. This is one of Dave's lines to me. I, you know, he was, we were in a meeting in his office and he gets Landau on the phone and they have some ridiculous, you know, moment and, and he takes this knife, you know, and just like stabs it into his desk and he like rips, you know, this, this desk apart, you know. I was like, it's like that sort of nice desk. I you know, what am I into here? And then I said, Dave, you know, the difference between you and me is that, you know, I, I kind of like people and sort of start with a kind of acceptance of them. And he said, no, I like people. They stack well, <laughs> you know. <laughs>